This picture right here was taken at Virginia Beach in 1988. Uh, this is the part that Puff brought Albie Short to him. We took a picture. I took a picture with Albie Short instead of taking a picture with Puff because at the time, Albie Short was the man. So we grabbed Albie Short and put him in a picture with us. And that's what this one is. Jahadi Way played for the Georgetown Hoyas and then when he graduated, he played for the Washington Wizards. And he was pretty much my plug to Michael Jordan and Allen Iverson and some of these other players that came to City. So Jahadi was uh, very instrumental in my matriculation as a, a, a promoter in the early 2000s. This is when EVIP Let's Become was in Vibe magazine. We bought a spot in Vibe back in, I believe this was 2002 or 2003. And at the time, I was doing business with Monty and Biz Marquis, and I got Biz Marquis to do the, the, the advertisement for me. And he's the one that kind of put it out there that says EVIP list. He said, when, you, when I need to know about the hottest parties and special events, I hit EVIPlist.com. Biz Marquis, number one party DJ in the country. Well, I like to tell people, man, every major city in the United States has a dominant business that the urban market commands. So we talk about New York, we talk about media, we talk about magazines, vibes, and sources. We talk about LA, we talk about Hollywood. We talk about Atlanta, we talk about music. DC was always known as the party city. And the reason we was always known as the party city because we always had events that ended up being a party. We had Congressional Black Caucus, we had Howard's Homecoming, um, Howard's graduation was a big time, Thanksgiving was a big time in DC. DC just does not read a, need, they need a reason to party. They just party. And back then, they were partying. DC became known synonymous was pretty women and parties. And it's been like that for 20 years. And Howard was a big reason behind that. Howard's homecoming was, was probably one of the biggest reasons that DC blew up on the party map. Because at the time, at Howard, you had Puffy coming back every year bringing his squad from Biggie on. That was one of the main things that pushed DC above. And you gotta remember, Ludacris and Biggie both mentioned Howard in songs back then. Going to Howard Homecoming. Those things, believe it or not, elevated the hell out of Howard's Homecoming. I mean, I would say, I would say 1999 up to about 2016, Howard's Homecoming has always dominated the landscape when it comes to parties in DC and always bring in people from out of town. But during that time, we also had people coming to town who were staying in town. You had Michael Jordan who played for the Wizards. You had Allen Iverson who went to Georgetown who came back every year to do a party. Then you also had Big Ticker who was here. He got a bottle, we got a bottle. Gilbert Arena, she chilling, we chilling. Even though they had hundreds of millions of dollars, nobody ever felt out of place in DC partying with these cats. Anytime I saw something where they, they ate the flowers or they had, was having a party, I was at Eric O'Brien's party. At the time, Republic Gardens, I believe, had set the stage for that, cele that celebrity type of thing going on. When we went to the Republic Gardens, Eric would be in there, Ron, it seemed like all the, the major players in the event game, they were all there. When we started EVIPs in 1999, the internet was brand new. I mean, spanking brand new. Not like it had been around five, 10 years, it was brand new. And, you know, during that time, companies like Yahoo and Google, Facebook wasn't even around. So we knew that we were moving toward a more technological society. And when I realized that emails was the gateway to people and getting them to respond, is much different from TV. And TV is one directional. It's my information going to you. But with email, I send you information. You can digest that information. If you have questions, you can revert back to me. What I discovered was when I was trying to build my list, a lot of people had Howard.edu or DC.gov or federal government was like HUD. You worked at HUD.gov and those were the main emails we got back then. There wasn't no Hotmail, wasn't no Yahoo, wasn't no Gmail. Most of the emails we got back then were government agencies or educational facilities. And we built our database off that. And then we started collecting emails um, from all over the country because what would happen was we would send out an email for a party and I had a way for people to send uh, four to 10 friends. In my mind, there's 10 like-minded individuals. So I kept those email addresses too. So you send out one email, you get back 10 emails. And that's how you, that's how you build it. You send out 10, you get back 100. That's how, you, that's how I built my database from one to 450,000. One thing about DC, it started this trend called the mega clubs. 
Now, a lot of cities have clubs, but DC had mega clubs. And one of the first mega clubs was DC Live. And then DC Live morphed into a VIP club. When I say mega clubs, these are clubs that hold 2,500 people or more on multiple floors. So DC Live was a mega club. That morphed into VIP club. And at the same time that launched, they had another club called Dream that launched. And Dream, owned by Mark Barnes, was probably one of the most famous clubs in the country at that time, literally. I mean, from Vegas, from, from LA to New York, everybody knew Dream. And the reason Dream was so famous is because it was a large club, it was a large venue. So five, we used to do 5,000 people every Friday. 5,000 people on a Friday. Three, 4,000 people on a Saturday. And special events on a Sunday. So you might do 22,000 people. So you might do a 10,000, 12,000 people during the weekend at one venue. And DC had like 10 venues. They had like H2O, they had Fur, they had Ibiza, they had Zanzibar, 1223. They had multiple venues that held more than a thousand people each. And they all did well on Fridays and Saturday nights during the 2000s. That's how prominent DC club life was back then. And DC club life went through two phases. We went through a mega club phase from like 1999, 2000 up to 2008. And then what happened in 2008? Obama. And just when we thought we had lost our mojo, it kicked back in again because Obama came to town. And Obama came to town, it was the beginning of the lounges. I think Barco, even one of the clubs that came around there, Barco, Pearl, uh, Bar 7. It was a lot of clubs that came around in town. They were more loungy, like uh, Living Room, but it was called Josephine's back then. So these are clubs that hold like four or 500 people. And that's how the city broke up. It went from 5,000 people on a Friday at one venue to 500 people at 10 venues on a Friday. It started, you know, it started breaking down into sales. So at that time, if you were a promoter, it was a good time to get involved in the game because now instead of one venue having 5,000 people on a Friday, you had 10 venues that had 500 people on a Friday and everybody could make money at that time. Everybody could eat. But the technology took it to a whole nother level because there was a market there. So there's a lot of technology that I see that keep advancing, but you gotta be ahead of the game. You gotta figure out what's the next thing that's coming. I mean, I'm kind of pissed because I should have looked at that technology like how Eric did. You know what I'm saying? Because Eric saw what was going on, the future of where it was leading. He, he, he always had that drive. So I know Eric would, would take something to another level, just like having parties in DC and then go, he was bold enough to take the parties up the East Coast. It's at the earliest social media stage because it was people clicking. Well, email, we decided that, you know, this is the future, this is where we're gonna go with it, and we're gonna stick to our gun. I would say EVIP list was the prelude to Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. In 2003, I'm past the statute of limitation, <laughs> 2003, we did a, uh, party at All Star in Atlanta. And during this time, they had the BMF, they had all these, you know, people down there making lots of lots of money. And we had a venue that we did Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Day parties and night parties. On that Monday, when it was time to count the money, we sat in the hotel room that Monday and counted 1.2 million dollars from one four day weekend in Atlanta because we had the bar and the door. Counted $1.2 million for one weekend. So that kind of gives you a perspective of the kind of money that was involved in nightlife. I had the opportunity at one point to sell AVIP lists for $8 million, but uh, the buyer, which was Radio One at the time, they went on and bought Black Planet, Magenta, and Asian Avenue, which had a combined subscriber base like 16 million. And I couldn't compete with that because I only had 450,000. But my 450,000 was clean. It was a good 450,000. We, we had pictures and information before all those dudes. We just was not big. We were not, I mean, we were big enough to dominate the urban market, but we weren't big enough to dominate the world market. And so, you know, I decided to stay in my lane and do what I do with EVIP lists. We should have been the ones that created Twitter. We had the people. We had it. We could have easily set it off that way. 
Well, the thing about me is that I was I stuck. I came with EVIP list, and I'm leaving with EVIP list, no matter what. And that's always been my goal: is to create a technology company versus a club a promoter business. My my thing was always technology. How can EVIP list move the culture? How can we move around? I can't imagine not having this database now. Like Eric is in a position where he can show you what we were talking about. You know these priceless memories and these events and these times. I haven't, I've, I haven't seen anybody else in a position to be able to do that. And when you look at it, it makes me almost want to tear up because it's like, man, I can't imagine if we didn't have this. You know, we have something like even Eric still has a, a, uh, you know, the, the, the photo album. Like, <laughs> no, I, it's nobody. If you do have a photo album, it's not as neat and clean and you know in order has, that he has it. So like these things are so important to the culture now because it's gone. It's just, it's more important than ever now that we that we can preserve, we have that, you know, that preservation. You have to talk to people. You have to make people want to be a part of your, your, your database. And if they know you have the hottest parties and special events, which is my motto, they'll, they'll follow. They will follow you and they will listen to you because the party we put out over the years from Jay-Z parties, Beyonce, whoever, Jeezy, whoever you want to name, any celebrity has come, th has come through EVIP list as, as, a, as a party, not as a personal person, but as a, a event going on with them. You know what I'm saying? So any, any urban event across the country, we've been a part with it.